This conference will now be recorded. Hello everyone, good evening and welcome to the talk session of MRCOG Hill. Uh, myself, I'm Dr. Bhavna Khera and I'm one of the mentors of the MRCOG Health course. Uh, in our recent days, we know that the talk articles have become very, very important. So basically, we have to go through the talk to gain marks and in fact to pass the exam. So it is not just important for part two, it is important for part three as well, because many times the stations uh, are prepared from the recent talk articles. So that is why they're important. And for part one, some anatomy or some questions from physiology may appear which have connection to the talk articles. So it's good if um, even the part one students are reading it from now only, it becomes easy in part two also and some knowledge also they can use in their part one exams. So off late the talk has become very important. Uh, but the issue is that reading a talk, a complete talk, sitting or at a home becomes a bit difficult uh, and because different, different articles and there are so many huge collection of talks. So we have started these sessions so that we can actually help you by doing one or two talks. Sometimes we are posting uh, in a YouTube link. Sometimes we are doing live sessions. Sometimes we are doing discussions uh, in a question answer format. Um, uh, in our group. So that is the way we are trying to cover last two or three years talk for all the candidates. So today I'm going to take up uh, this 2021 talk. It, this is issue four and I'm going to take two articles today. One is on uh, this recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis, very important topic and very favorite of uh, exam also examiners also. And the other one I'm going to take today is the energy-based devices. Uh, previously, we had a talk article on the cautery, electrocautery and laparoscopy. So we all know how many times the questions have appeared from those particular talk articles. So I believe that now this energy-based devices, uh, which are used in minimal assist surgery, is also going to be a one of favorite talk articles for the examiners. So I've chosen these two talk articles for today. It will be almost a 30 minute session and I hope you take uh, home all the important points which are related to these talk articles. So I'm starting with the update on recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis. So this is actually an, uh, when you have an isolated episode that is acute vulvovaginal candidiasis. But when a woman has four or more repeated episodes over a period of 12 months, Okay, so this is four or more repeated episodes, at least it should be four, if we call it recurrent, in a period of 12 months or one year. Out of these four, at least two of these episodes should be confirmed by culture in microscopy. So they should be confirmed that they are due to the candida itself. So recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis is diagnosed when a woman has four or more. So remember the word four, four or more reported episodes over a 12 months period. And two of these should be confirmed, which can be either by the culture or microscopy. But at least one should be with the help of culture. The second commonest, this is the vulvovaginal candidiasis is the second commonest genital infection in women after bacterial vaginosis. So the most commonest one is the bacterial vaginosis and second commonest is the genital infection. 75% of the women will have at least one episode of vulvovaginal candidiasis in their lifetime. So it is so, so common. 75% will, women will have one episode at least, but only 6% will go into the recurrent candidiasis. But recurrent candidiasis, although the number is less, it is 6%, but actually it carries a huge burden of um, health issues on the society, on, as a community as a whole, and also for the woman and her family. Because it is such an irritating thing that it really takes a huge toll on female psychology and her sexual relationships. So overall hurting a complete family. 
So most cases of acute uh, vulvogenic candidiasis and recurrent are caused by the candida albicans. So this remains the most common pathogen. The remainder are caused by either candida species or yeast such as candida glabrata, candida crusae, and saccharomyces cerevisiae. What are the various risk factors which can predispose? We still we are not sure that who, which women will go into the recurrent and which women will just have one single episode. We are not sure about it, but it has been seen that there are some risk factors which predispose the woman to develop a recurrent infections. So ex ex estrogen exposure like puberty, pregnancy, if a patient is on hormone replacement therapy or on hormonal contraception, use of broad spectrum antibiotics within the last three months, poorly controlled diabetes mellitus, local irritants like perfume, soaps, wet wipes, fabric conditioners and douches, even a compromised state, new sexual partner, any use of spermicidal gel or creams, non-compliance with the antifungal therapy, in which people usually take off and on antifungal therapies, resistance to therapy, and iron deficiency anemia is also a risk factor. So this, these points are very, very important points from, uh, for exam question point of view also. So just to repeat, estrogen exposure anytime, whenever like in puberty, in pregnancy, in hormone replacement therapy or hormonal contraception, or if the patient is using broad spectrum antibiotics within the last three months, poorly controlled diabetes mellitus, local irritants, perfume soaps, wet wipes, fabric conditions, and douches, immunocompromised states, new sexual partners, pharmaceutical gel and creams, non-compliance with antifungal therapy, resistance to antifungal therapy, and iron deficiency anemia. These are signs and symptoms. Persistent vulval itch, non-offensive vaginal discharge. Vaginal discharge is there, which is mostly curdy, curdy white, thick white, sometimes can be thin also, but it is non-offensive. It does not have any foul smell. There is a lot of soreness. Soreness is a very, very important point. Itch, soreness, burning sensation is there. And because of the soreness and fissuring, there is superficial dyspareunia also. So there is erythema, there is fissuring and swelling edema, satellite lesions and excoriation. And symptoms may be cyclical in nature. So they develop around the time of the menstrual cycle or sometimes like that. So often in your exam scenario, you will have these key words. Patient has a severe itch with some curdy white type of discharge. And specifically, there will be soreness. And along with soreness, there will be edema, fissuring will be there and satellite lesions. Satellite lesion is a very, very important point often given in the exam scenarios of vulvovaginal candidiasis. Up to 20% of the women may be colonized with the candida species during their reproductive years, but without clinical features, they do not need any treatment. So remember, no treatment for asymptomatic candida. If you have find the candida on uh, your microscopic examination in some culture, which you have taken for some other reason, then you don't have to treat that patient. Asymptomatic candida patients require no treatment. Okay, it is only the symptomatic patients who will require the treatment. Investigations are high vaginal swab for culture testing. Of course, we want to look microscopy, pH. pH is a very, very easy thing which can be seen in the clinics or the outdoors. So in this case, uh, it is usually the pH is less than or equal to 4.5. If the pH is higher, more likely you are dealing with the bacterial vaginosis or the trichomonas vaginalis. So high pH, you are most likely dealing with bacterial vaginosis or trichomonas vaginalis. Secretions should be collected from the lateral sides of the vaginal wall using the swab. HB1C tests to exclude diabetes mellitus. 
and consider full blood count to rule out anemia. As I said, anemia, iron deficiency anemia is a risk factor for recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis. So anyway, we have to look for the to rule out anemia also. In women with recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis who also suffer from other recurrent infections like they have upper respiratory tract infections or recurrent otitis media, then this can be due to the mannose binding glycine deficiency. So this is a different type of entity in which along with VVC, there will be other things also. Now this uh, table, this chart is a very good summary of the features of bacterial vaginosis and trichomonas vaginalis also. So in bacterial vaginosis, basically there is imbalance in the vaginal flora causing a rise in pH levels to 4.6. As I have already mentioned, whenever you have a pH greater than 4.5, think of bacterial vaginosis and trichomonas vaginalis. There are few lactobacilli and an increase in the anaerobic bacteria. Risk factors are if the patient is smoking, if she is constantly douching, black ethnicity, new sexual partner, any type of sexually transmitted infection, concurrent infections, herpes. So these all in this, it, it is a high risk factor. Signs and symptoms, there is a fishy discharge, which is typically thin white thin, white, homogeneous, watery discharges there, but it has a foul smell. In Canada, we were not having any foul smell. So here it is a fishy discharge, and it can be seen in up to 50% patients. And 50% patients are usually asymptomatic. Investigations, pH test you can do with the litmus paper, or you can do microscopy, or there are criteria, AMSLs or AISM criteria. Management, metronidazole is a drug of choice. 400 milligram orally twice a day for five to seven days, or you can give two gram metronidazole orally start. Intravaginal gel can be used, which is 0.75% once daily for five days, or intravaginal clindamycin cream can be used, which is 2% cream and once daily for seven days. Alternatives are, you can use tinidazole 2 gram also, or clindamycin 300 milligram orally twice a day for seven days. General vulval advice is the most important thing to be followed, and probiotics can help in the condition. Coming on to the trichomonas vaginalis, a sexually transmitted infection which is caused by the flagellated protozoa, that is trichomonas vaginalis, it occurs in the older age group, non-white ethnicity, concurrent infection with chlamydia or gonorrhea, or people living with HIV, that is, concurrent any type of STI. There is a vaginal discharge, again it is foul smelling. Vulvovaginal itch is there, dysuria, vulvovaginitis, ulcerations can be seen, and there can be low abdominal pain but 50% patients are asymptomatic. Investigations done are, you can take the vaginal swab from the posterior fornix and then make a wet preparation or microscopy and see it under the microscope. You can see the moving protozoa because it has flagella. NAT test is a good test, but it is not very um, like available on most of the centers. So this wet mount test is the most important one. Culture of T. vaginalis culture broad, first choice would be triple NAC if available. But if not, then you can send sample for NAT, TV culture, or TV point of care test. Usually, it is the one which you make the wet, wet preparation and you see it under the microscope. That is the most easily accessible test. Metronidazole 2 gram orally stat is the drug of choice, or you can use metronidazole 400 to 500 milligram orally twice a day for five to seven days. Alternative are tinidazole to gram orally start, must ensure the partner is treated and both avoid sex until they have been completed treatment. Now coming to management of vulvovaginal candidiasis. 
always always when we talk of any these conditions we have always to be talk uh, we should always be talking about the general advice so general advice we have to take care of what are the risk factors so avoid local irritants such as perfume so shampoo bubble bath fabric softener and wipes because we have just now seen that they are all risk factors for the recurrent vulvo candidiasis so we are going to tell the patient that you, she should avoid these things simple home emollients can be used as soap substitute or general moisturizer wash just once a day some people have a habit of washing it again and again and particularly when they have itchy they tend to do a repeated washing so that has not to be done so specifically you have to tell the patient that she should not do repeated washing avoid tight fitting garments that might irritate the area if possible avoid pads or panty liners as these prevent aeration and avoid vaginal douching treatment regimens these are the important treatment regimens which are used in an acute that is first episode it is the oral one which is used fluconazole 50 mg oral single dose and if it is recurrent then you will give 150 mg initially orally every 72 hours so every 72 hours you have to give three doses 150 mg after 72 hours 150 mg then after 72 hours again 150 mg after that 150 mg mg oral once per week for 6 months so this is for the recurrent one in in which you start with three doses which are 72 hours apart and then you give once a week for next 6 months if it, if you are not giving the oral then clotrimazol pessary that is 500 mg per vaginally single dose on a single episode if it is a recurrent episode then this pessary has to be given for 7 to 14 days according to response and then followed by the maintenance dose that is once a per week for next 6 months if it is a non candida albicans species or there is a resistance to the fluconazole then nystatin is the drug of choice so nystatin pessary is 1 lakh units per vagina 12 to 14 nights is the treatment for single episode if you are going to treat for the recurring vulvovaginal candidiasis then per month for 14 nights you have to give 1 lakh units per vagina and per vaginally 14 nights in a month for next 6 months so if it is non candida albicans or if it is a fluconazole resistance then nystatin is the drug of choice coming to vulvo candidiasis in pregnancy it is uh, the rate of carriage increases from 22 30 to 40% we read it was 20% in a reproductive age group women non pregnant women but in pregnant women it increases to 30 to 40% and symptomatic candidiasis is also commoner so therefore we have to treat again the same rule we have to treat only the symptomatic patients we are not going to treat the asymptomatic patients okay the carriage is increased but we are not going to treat the asymptomatic patients so now the oral results are not good because if they are given over a long period of time the skeletal malformations in the infant has been reported if it is given over a extended period of time so it is not a preferred drug it is basically the uh, the topical agent which is the preferred one so acute vulvovaginal candidiasis again same 500 mg clotrimazole pessary which can be given for 7 nights then if it is a recurrent one then in induction you can give it for 10 to 14 nights followed by once a week pessary for next uh, as many days the pregnancy is lasting topical or intravaginal treatments can affect the condoms and put the woman at risk of unwanted pregnancy this is very important whenever you give intravaginal therapies you have to tell this to the patient fluconazole and other ozols can react with other medication when given in multiple dose regimens 
particularly in relation to their association with hypokalemia and prolongation of QT interval. So a clear medical history should be sought. Supplementary therapies with citrazine and probiotics is helpful. Now coming to next top article, which is review of advanced energy devices for minimal excess gynecologist. This is a very good talk article. It has covered all recently available energy-based devices and very nicely summarized all everything about these energy-based devices. What are the advantages? Uh, what is basically the biophysics behind it? What are the advantages? What are the disadvantages? And what are the safety issues? Uh, safety issues regarding various energy-based devices. So this is a very, very nice talk article. And I think uh, uh, in part one also, you can have some questions in biophysics from this talk article. Coming on to various energy-based devices, one by one I'm taking. This is advanced bipolar device. So it is basically, we have already read Cotri. So we know that what is unipolar devices and what is bipolar. Bipolar means there are two electrodes. You can see the two ends here of the faucet, this, uh, this particular instrument. So here it is two prongs. When tissue is held between the two prongs, the current passes from one electrode, that is one prong, through the tissue and then back to the, the second electrode or the second prong. So the current does not require to pass through the body of the patient. It just passes through the tissue which you are holding between the two prongs. So that is the utility of bipolar faucets. So basically when you hold a tissue between the two, the, the, between the two prongs, the current is passing only through that. So there will be very less lateral spread of heat. This is one of the most important advantage of bipolar over the unipolar. This we already know from our previous knowledge. Now, what is difference in our, this advanced bipolar device? This device is meant for hemostasis as well as cutting, okay? The bipolar forces which you use in the cautery is meant only for the coagulation. So here it is, uh, you are going to do the electrocoagulation and it has integral blade inside it. So that blade can be used as like a scissor. So it combines bipolar electrocoagulation with an integral blade to deliver hemostasis and cutting in one device. And they can seal the vessels up to seven millimeter in diameter. Key feature of ABDs is the incorporation of technology capable of detecting tissue impedance. So how does this work? This actually depends on what is the tissue impedance, okay? So when the tissue impedance is low, it, it, it works for the coagulation. So as the tissue solidifies, it gets sealed up, the resistance increases, and that leads to increase in the higher, cut, higher current. So that will lead to cutting option, okay? So as this is all automated thing, so uh, once you trigger it, it will coagulate and then when you want it to cut, it will cut. So a key feature of ABTs is the incorporation of technology capable of detecting tissue impedance. This change in the tissue impedance will trigger it from coagulation to cutting. The integrated feedback system within the device monitors the tissue impedance to determine when the seal is complete. What are the advantages? They provide reliable, reliable vessel sealing at supraphysiological burst pressure. What is burst pressure, which is defined as maximal pressure required to overcome the vessel seal? So it, it works at a supraphysiological burst pressure. So any type of pressure cannot open that vessel. So vessel is very properly sealed. They allow the surgeon to cut the tissue without radio frequency energy because it is just the same energy, the bipolar energy, which is being used to cut also. So this is important because it, uh, it actually limits the uh, thermal injury to the adjacent areas. So ABDs, that is advanced bipolar devices, are useful when reliable 
simple vessel sealing is required, particularly when you are looking for sealing a larger vessel like your uterine arteries. So it is a very good technique for routine hysterectomy and basic adenexin surgery. But it is not very good for complex dissection. We are just now coming to that why it is not good for the complex dissection. Safety points, it is important to keep the instrument tip clean to maximize the function of disease because if the tissue is, remains attached there, then complete amount of current cannot be delivered. Placing the graft tissue under tension during device activation will reduce the coagulation effect. So often we are in a habit that whenever we have to burn something, we try to hold it with the tension so that we are not touching any other area and we are very specifically bringing it uh, to a separate place. But actually when you um, put a tension on that particular tissue, the coagulation effects decreases, okay? So if you, are, you want to do the coagulation and use the maximum amount of energy, you have to leave the tissue relaxed. So it is done by best achieved by relaxing the tension on the tissue. So while you are coagulating, leave the tissue re relaxed. But when you are cutting, then you can pu pull up the tissue and place it under tension and it helps in the cutting. Now this, these devices can result in lateral thermal spread up to 7 mm. Although the lateral thermal spread is much less than the unipolar, but still it can occur up to 7 mm. So, you should maintain a safe margin of 0.5 to 1 centimeter from vital tissue and you should use the minimum power setting and activation time, the time for which you are shooting, that should be less, okay? So you have to do it in parts. This is the way you have to do this, um, uh, this work with the bipolar devices. Now, when I read the last line of this last slide, I told you that we don't use it in complex dissection. So now this is the reason why we are not using it for the complex dissection. Because although the lateral spread is very, very less, but still it is there. So when you are like uh, trying to work in the deep infiltrating endometriosis, then you may land up into a problem and injure, in, injure the adjacent structure with the thermal damage. So therefore, uh, this is not good for the complex surgeries. But yes, in normal hysterectomies, this is a very good option because it, it is good to see in the larger vessels. Coming to the next type of devices, which are ultrasound devices. These instruments utilize the ultrasound to seal vessels and cut tissue without the need for the integral blade. So here, no blade is required. It is basically the ultrasound energy, which is transmitted into the mechanical energy. And that is going to work. So these are usually single use instruments like harmonic, sonicizon, and lotus. They are licensed to seal vessels up to five mm in diameter. So they are good for smaller vessel diameters. It is harmonic ACE plus. This is one which is good for the uh, seven mm vessels also. So remaining all are licensed for just five mm vessels. Now what happens, we all know ultrasound uh, waves are the waves which are uh, outside the audible sound waves, the range of out, uh, audible sound waves. So what happens, there is piezoelectric material which is present in the transducer. So now when this is placed under stress, this ultrasonic energy, which is basically a sound energy, and it gets uh, converted into the, it gets converted into the ultrasonic energy. This mechanical energy in form of ultrasonic waves is transferred to active blade of the device, causing it to vibrate or oscillate at the rates of 36,000 to 55,500 uh, 55, hertz. So uh, this mechanical energy will lead to vibrations in the prongs. Now at low energy settings, this, these vibrations which set up, they lead to breakage of the hydrogen bonds 
and subsequent denaturation of the proteins. And this denaturation which occurs that lead to formation of coagulum and that actually welds the vessels. So that acts as a glue and it acts to seal the vessel so that a hemostatic seal is formed. So this is known as the coaptive, coaptive coagulation. So this is the way it works. So basically, from baritosonic energy, there is electrical energy, which leads to uh, the vibrations. Vibrations lead to breaking of the bonds and coagulum formation. And this coagulum will, lead, will work as a sealing agent. So it will seal the vessels. Ultrasound scalpel effect is a consequence of cavitation. So this is the one which is low energy settings and formation of coagulum that is coagulative coagulation. This is the mechanism of the coagulation. Now, how does it cut? It cuts by the mechanism of cavitation. At high energy settings, the mechanical energy causes the production of small vapor cavities, which collapse, which join together to lead to cell destruction and tissue dissection. So, to remember, the coagulation is done at low energy settings and phenomena is coactive coagulation. And cutting is done at high energy settings and the phenomenon responsible is the cavitation. What are the advantages? You can do the precise dissection there because there is no later thermal spread. So there is precise dissection. So it is very good in doing the complex dissections, which we said we cannot use, do with the bipolar devices, but these type of things we can do with the ultrasound devices. So they are particularly favorable for cases requiring complex dissection, such as excision of deep in, uh, infiltrating endometriosis, urethrolysis, and laparoscopic myomectomy. Cutting in hemostasis is achieved in one step because we can use the low energy settings to coagulate and hemostasis, and we can use the high energy setting for cutting. So both can be done together in one step. It tends to generate less smoke as compared to bipolar devices. So there is more visibility and there is less exposure for the surgical team. So these are the advantages. Energy can be delivered without the need to grasp tissue between the jaws of device. This is a very, very important point uh, because in bipolar, we need to catch hold of that tissue. In this, there is a phenomena known as back scoring in which the jaws will remain open because actually what happens here is that the two jaws, which you see, only the inferior one is active. Superior so one is not active, it is not oscillating. So it is just for the holding, that's all. So it is the inferior one which is leading to the function of coagulation or cutting. So that inferior one, that has to be just touched to the tissue to activate the effect in the tissue. So this is known as back scoring. So because you are using only one uh, electrode, which is the back electrode for the purpose. So energy can be delivered without the need to grasp tissue between the jaws uh, of the device. This is known as batch scoring. A unique feature of these devices with jaws open, the surgeon places the back of the lower blade in contact with the tissue while activating and moving the device. What are the safety issues? They are significantly higher tip temperatures, okay? There is no lateral thermal spread, but the tip, tip remains heated for some time. Even after the post-activation, the tip is still, it, it carries a residual heat, and it carries a residual heat longer than the monopolar or bipolar devices. So this is important, okay? How can you minimize tissue damage because of this residual heat in the tip? You can minimize the activation time. You can use the lower energy settings, the minimal one which is required for your work. Use irrigation to cool the tip. So you can also do the water irrigation to cool the tip 
and always keep the chip in your view either you remove the device immediately after working or if you are keeping it inside you have to keep it in the view so that you know you are not touching it here and there and wait before manipulating the tissue so you just have to take care of that tip which remains uh, heated for a longer time and it is basically there are more there is more uh, residual heat as compared to other devices now this is hybrid energy devices so hybrid we all know hybrid means there are two things combining together so you are thunder beat this is a only hybrid device which is available and it combines both ultrasound and bipolar energy so it is licensed for use on vessels up to 7 mm of diameter now here what happens is that you can use the bipolar energy to seal and you can use the uh, ultrasound energy to cut so this is the way you can use both energies together so there are two modes two modes seal and cut and seal so you can seal it with the bipolar and then cut with the ultrasound or you can use only one mode and seal the vessel thunder thunder beat is licensed for use on vessels up to 7 mm and it generates higher tip temperatures and takes longer to cool than the your previous two devices therefore it is recommended that surgeons exert the same level of caution as when operating with the ultrasound based devices to avoid inadvertent tissue damage as a consequence of residual heat so basically in this you have to use less number of equipments and uh, the working efficiency of this equipment is more uh, also in same energy it does both the work so ergonomics is improved otherwise it uses both the technologies this is plasma devices so what happens in the plasma devices plasma devices utilize the radio frequency energy to create a plasma jet capable of causing superficial hemostasis they are advanced energy cutting devices so in this plasma is a gas containing free ions and electrons it can be generated by applying high voltage energy to an inert gas so when in inert gas when the high voltage energy is given then this plasma beam you can see free ions and electrons are released so this is the gas in which the current is passed and you see this is the beam which is produced as it hits the tissue this leads to uh, the injury at that particular site or you can see say that we use this injury as a surgical mode so the handheld component of the devices contains electrode that ionizes a stream of gas as it passes over them this generates a plasma beam that can be directed to the surgical site the handheld devices can be used in open and laparoscopic procedures and this is basically a non touch method because that beam has to be shot from a certain difference distance so you have to focus that beam on the surgical site and it is no touch it will not go in touch there pds can deliver energy with the minimal penetration depth resulting in superficial damage the effects only up to 2, 2 mm or it a lateral spread is also less because it is highly focused you focus it at a one point and only at that particular point it is created mostly the effects are superficial thermal effects tip of the device will always remain cool negating any complications caused by the residual heat there is no smoke so there is clear visibility and there is no smoke exposure to the surgical team but it cannot go deep it cannot coagulate large vessels the most of the effects are just the superficial tissue effects and the gas which flows can create the intra abdominal pressures and necessitate frequent evacuation of pneumoperitoneum the gas which is being released the beam which is being released when it gets accumulated it will lead to increase in the pressures what are the safety tissue safety issues basically this is commonly it is used for ablating the endometriosis okay so you just can ablate or you can excise the endometriotic deposits this is the main use here but because of its excessive gas there is a risk of gas emboli 
and there is uh, excessive intra-abdominal pressure raise. So what are the uh, things we can do to minimize the risk of these complications? Use the lowest flow rate required to achieve hemostasis. Remove the instrument when not in use. Use gas encephalators with non-defectable pressure alarms. Never touch the tissue while the device is active. I'll follow the manufacturer's recommendations for use and staff training. Laser devices. A laser is an instrument that projects a highly concentrated beam of light through the stimulated emission of photons. We all use that laser pointers uh, in our demonstrations. So laser devices are used. And I think nowadays it's a very common thing. Um, otherwise, there are machines also for vaginal therapies and also so surgical tips are also used. And there are some uh, fiber optics which is also used to deliver this laser beam in minimal excess surgery also. CO2 lasers are most commonly used for that. They operate in the infrared spectrum that is 10,600 nanometer. This wavelength is important because at this wavelength, there is uh, the absorption peak is highest for the water. So water can easily absorb the laser beam. In laser, they have particular wavelengths, okay? Because laser beam is, that is coherent, collimated. So it has single wavelength, okay? So depending on what wavelength you are shooting, uh, the molecule which is going to take up that wavelength is going to get affected. So when you use CO2 laser at this particular wavelength, the uh, molecule which is going to take up this laser is the water. So water is present in the cells. So that is why it is going to directly affect the cells. CO2 lasers dem demonstrate the limited thermal penetrance. It is just minimal penetrance and minimal lateral spread. So it just acts very sharp, pointed on a particular spot which is going to be affected. CO2 laser devices are capable of precise cutting at hemostasis with limited adjacent tissue damage. Consequently, they are particularly useful for excision of lesions, for example, endometriosis or malignancy close to ureters, bladder, and bowel cirrhosis. Superficial hemostatic effect is useful for ablation of endometrioma cyst walls. So again, small, small lesions, they can be uh, worked upon as a as if it is like, it really cuts like as if you are using your cautery devices. It just works like a blade and the surgical tips helps in cutting. These are the, this is the chart of the biothermal effects which we see at various temperatures. 37 degree is a normal temperature. 45 to 50 degrees, this is hypothermia. There is reduced enzyme activity and necrosis is there. 60 to 80, denaturation of proteins and collagen. Coagulation and desiccation. 100 degrees, vaporization and ablation. Greater than 100, it's carbonization. And greater than 300, there is melting. So usually we use temperatures somewhere around 50 to 60 degrees centigrade. So we try to keep it up to 50 because this is the point where we actually need the effect. So thank you so much for your patient listening. And we have covered two very important TROG articles. Uh, I would like that you all go through these TROG articles where by the time they are fresh in your minds so that you can easily remember the important points. And today I'll be posting the CPG questions in the group so that um, in our MRCOG Health General Group, so that we can solve the, those questions and uh, that way we can revise the talk. Any queries from anyone? I hope you find the session interesting and find it useful. Yes, ma'am, as always. <laughs> okay, great. So we can uh, finish the session today. And tomorrow, I'll be posting CPDs in the group. Do go through 
uh, the recording and to go through these talk articles, you will remember important. See, see how you can remember the talk articles because there are so many talk articles. You cannot just uh, just keep on reading it again. It's good to remember the important points. Questions. Yeah, sure, ma'am. Sure. Thank you so much. Okay. So thank just you, thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And we are doing.